be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Road Home Podcast with Ethan Nickturn. Join Ethan as he and his guests explore the Buddhist path as it relates to art, culture, activism, politics, Western psychology, and more. If you'd like to support Ethan's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Ethan. So hi, everybody. This is Ethan. Just a little addendum pre-footnote before we get into our excellent podcast interview with author and meditation teacher Kate Johnson. Um, It was so lovely to have a little break from the podcast. It's really wonderful to be back um, every two weeks uh, with new podcast episodes this fall. And just a little footnote um, that at a certain point later on in the interview, I mistakenly refer to the uh, activist, the journalist, and the um, scholar and academic uh, Hannah Nicole Jones uh, as Ida Bay Wells. Uh, and Ida Bay Wells was a uh, seminal uh, African American uh, journalist. Um, and uh, I had a little brain fart there. And uh, so deep apologies to uh, Hannah Nicole Jones. Um, but the, the, there's some context around the brain fart, which is uh, that Hannah Nicole Jones actually goes by Ida Bay Wells on her Twitter account to pay homage to the journalist. And also Hurricane Ida uh, was coming through when we recorded. So I had um, a little bit of a decontextualized brain fart. So want to apologize for that. Um, but uh, speaking of Hurricane Ida, I hope everybody is safe and recovering at this point. Um, and whatever climate crisis event you've had this year, because we've all pretty much had one uh, or more, um, that we're all thinking about interdependence and how we can uh, mindfully influence systems going forward, which is a great transition into um, my interview with author Kate Johnson on her new book, Radical Friendship. So that's it. That's the pre- the pre footnote, um, and uh, enjoy the episode. So, hi everybody! Welcome back to the Road Home Podcast after a bit of a hiatus. Uh, I'm Ethan Nickturn, and I'm joined by one of my dear friends, uh, who's actually been on the podcast before. Was on episode two of the Road Home Podcast, and now we're fifty something episodes later. Wow. Um, uh, Kate Johnson. A meditation teacher and author, and we're here to celebrate and talk about her first book that just came out, uh, which is called Radical Friendship, Seven Ways to Love Yourself and Find Your People in an Unjust World. So Kate, well, welcome back to The Road Home. Oh, thank you so much, Ethan. It's good to be here. Yeah. So I want to encourage everybody who wants to kind of find out more about Kate's history with meditation. Cause I usually, the first time I have somebody on, I ask them like, how did you get into meditation? But I think we already kind of talked about that, that aspect of things. So I just want to start with a better question, which is how are you? Oh, <laughs> thank you. I'm good. I'm good. It's, um, I'm good. I feel like I'm catching my breath. You know, um, it feels really nice to have put this book out into the world. I was working on it for a really long time. Um, writing a book is, is, is really hard. I don't know if you, you knew that, um, <laughs> The book is so hard. And um, and so it feels really nice to just have it um yeah, have it launched and to be able to have other people engage with the ideas that up until this point were just swirling around in my head and um to be able to talk about them. Yeah. Yeah. Writing a book is hard. And also one of the things I find that's hard is you'd like finish it in certain stages you finish like a proposal and then a rough draft and then but there's all these stages so you feel done with it and then it kind of like keeps being born yeah <laughs> until it actually comes out <laughs> totally yeah i feel like it's a good way to put it it keeps being born and and um and then of course in the process of writing you know i'm still learning i'm growing i'm changing my understanding is evolving you know and so every time i go back to what i wrote before um i might see it a little differently or just um yeah see where i could 
say it more clearly or maybe something doesn't apply anymore. So it, even now it feels a little bit like an artifact of a um, something that I was working out really strongly like a year or so ago. Um, and uh, probably if I wrote a book today on vertical friendship, I'd write a different book, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the book that I, I am. I feel happy with the book that I wrote. I feel not embarrassed by it, which is <laughs> the goal. you know. Right. And that's the other challenge, right? Is to write something of the moment, but that also has a timeless quality, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's funny. People are, um, keep saying like, wow, this is the perfect time for this book to come out. And, you know, it was also the perfect time a year ago and it was the perfect time, like the first time the book was due, you know? Um, so that, that, that does feel good that, um, there's something in this topic that feels like it's always going to be relevant. Um, and I feel mm-hmm. like it's partially cause it's a part of the path that is, is always going to be needed. Yeah. 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 Uh, one thing I noticed about radical friendship is, and you say this in the, at the end in the acknowledgements that there's certain books that you view it as kind of being in, in company of like, you know, radical Dharma or, mm-hmm. you know, Lama Radoan's love and rage or Ruth King's uh, mindful of race. Or I was also thinking of seven A's book. You belong. Cause For you sure. have a very, uh, kind of, it, it's very much you. It's very much, I, I, I felt both your, uh, your tenderness and your occasional fierceness, but um, also just your kind of like quirky sense of humor. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> that was a, also a goal. <laughs> but the the other, so it's very of the moment, but the other thing I noticed about this book is it does something none of those books do, which is the entire book is a commentary on a classic Buddhist sutta. Like you take one sutta or sutra and the whole book is breaking down a commentary. And that's that part of it, even though it's a very 2021 book, that's a very classic teaching style in Buddhism to actually yeah. take uh, a origin text and give like modern context and commentary around that. So was that your idea or did you just, how did you come to write this about the the friendship sutra, the, the Mita Sutta? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for that reflection. I, how did I come to write it? Well, you know, I, I talk about this a little bit in the book, but it came, the the request to write a book came out of a talk that I gave at a Buddhist conference. And I was approached by a, a, a publisher to write a book based on this talk, which, which is really a call to action to Buddhist practitioners to say, hey, look, we have this incredible technology for working with our own minds and hearts and for understanding um, the cause and effect relationship between moments of perception and um, body sensation and thought and emotion. And um, that we have this opportunity that's unique actually um, to interrupt uh, implicit bias and to interrupt um, racism and misperception uh, kind of at the level of, of perception and thought before it goes into action. And that most, um, most anti-racism efforts have to do with kind of like behavior modification because Mm -hmm. there's this sense that, you know, thoughts are so automatic. People can't necessarily arrest their thoughts, but they can, um, they can change their behavior. And I was thinking like, well, actually that's all we do as mindfulness practitioners. (laughs) And maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe we could actually start to shift, um, shift some of our biases at the level of thought and really transform our minds, um, to, to perceive ourselves and, and, and each other differently. Um, and, uh, and so when someone asked me to write a book about that, that was, I, I didn't really have a whole lot more to say about that, other than that we should do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that there were people who were working on books that were, um, more working with the like kind of neuroscience of perception and a relationship to Buddhist psychology. And, um, and that's, I'm interested in it, but it's not really my area of expertise, but what I, what I thought I could really write about is, um, how, like what, what it is that might make someone want to do that work because it's really hard and it's annoying and it brings up shame and embarrassment and, um, you know, potentially having to look at places, ways in which we've been harmed by others where we've harmed others. Um, and so I was thinking like, why would anyone want to do this other than like, you know, a few like weirdos who are really into, you know, into it, like a, you know, as a um, area of fascination. And I thought, Oh, well, friendship, you know, like people would do it for, for, for the love that exists in, in a, in a really beautiful friendship. And so mm-hmm. um, I was also at the time looking for a, a better 
model that we could look to within Buddhist communities to uh, show up for each other aside from allyship, which seemed kind of transactional and, um, I don't know, uh, dry (laughs) more more than what we wanted to be to each other. Um, So it was kind of that combination that led me toward looking at a spiritual friendship and then specifically the Mita Sutta. And I think, you know, yeah, why I structured it around the text is I wanted it to have the sense of grounding, you know, and I, Mm. I really, I feel like, um, there was some pressure to kind of secularize the book and make it more like, um, you know, I'm just Kate and I'm talking about, you know, my views on friendship and, um, partially I don't feel like an expert on friendship. (laughs) Like, I feel like I'm still really learning about it. And I know that this is, a I, I, I value the teachings, which are, like time honored and tested. Um, and I felt confident talking about what I knew about friendship through the lens of the, the, the Buddha's teaching more than I did just, you know, talking about my experience alone. Um, and I don't think that's like, not that I don't have sometimes confidence issues, but I don't think that one's in particular, like a lack of confidence as much as it is like, it feels really good to have the the foundation and the grounding and the gravity of a Buddhist text from which to, to talk about these, these contemporary issues. Right. Cause otherwise it feels like you're kind of making, making it up or just like being a mindfulness influencer and there's no sense of source or lineage or totally. where you're coming from. Or worse, not making it up, but pretending I did, which is something that I think right. also can happen, you know, <laughs> being like, Oh yeah, I just really thought of this seven part framework it's you know yeah. <laughs> like change the words a little bit and be like look what i made um which you know I yeah didn't. yeah yeah so i would say that there's another kind of source text this is just my reading that's much more modern that you're kind of combining with that which is i thought the way you wove in in at, at the very beginning um the 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 features of a society that that's, or, you know, a system that's based on white supremacy Mm -hmm. um, from the dismantling racism uh, work book, um, uh, which was written by, is it Tima or Oakland? Tema. Tema Tema and and Kenneth Jones. And so, I mean, so, so that this is not something that gets done a lot where you have uh, uh, interpretation of a classic Buddhist sutra with also and here are the features of white supremacy and here's how we can look at this classic buddhist teaching through a modern lens or maybe not i I don't even know if white supremacy is modern so much as like you know last many hundred years Mm -hmm. um but through the lens of white supremacy um so it's interesting because it those almost it almost feels like you're giving a commentary on those two texts as your as your source to and then play with your own experience as a student and teacher yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, and as I'm listening to you talk about it, I'm like, no wonder it took me so long to write this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a seven, a seven part sutta, which is a short sutta, but it has a lot to unpack. And then the, uh, the 10 qualities of white supremacy. Right? Yeah. Or, well, I really, you know, yeah. I mean, I thought, um, when I was trying to, um, articulate what for me was a more felt sense like hunch or um, it was a little hard, a little stronger than a hunch, like a kind of conviction that there was something about um, the Buddhist teachings on spiritual friendship that were truly radical and that they had this, this potential to transform not only our spiritual life and our path around, like, you know, just within our, you know, spiritual communities, you know, meditation centers, et cetera. But there was also something that was, really had the potential to transform um, what was happening even in like, you know, other kinds of communities, like um, uh, like activist communities or neighborhoods. Um, and to try to articulate, well, what, why is that so radical? Like what is, what is transformative about um, saying that I'm, I'm totally here for not only for my own liberation, but also for your liberation and that um that 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 can be a primary practice um and and i i think it clicked for me when i read when i reread that um 
that document around the characteristics of white supremacy culture and saw especially those um, those points about um, individualism and isolation um, and uh, the way in which um, white supremacy, white, cultures that are based in white supremacy and also just, I, I think, um, totalitarianism, <laughs> you know, that they rely on us being like separate from one another. They rely on us like hating ourselves and being suspicious of one another. Um, and that that's kind of makes people um, easier to control, you know, easier to mm-hmm. dominate, um, easier to mislead. Um, and so that there seem to be all these other political um, ramifications of this like sense of separation, not just with, you know, which I'd heard mostly talked about as like this, um, you know, existential kind of suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I'm like, oh, this is also uh, the sense of separation, the way that it manifests on the societal level is really, is really, really deep. Um, and uh, I wanted, I wanted these frameworks to be able to talk to one another. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the other like really deep conversation is, and I feel like this has been a lot of my work in kind of retraining my view, you know, which is, um, you know, I've always been very progressively educated, but it's interesting because you view on, on one level, you kind of, on one level, you kind of view the different problems that the world faces as kind of, we have this basket of problems, you know? So for example, when I'm reading that list, you know, if you wanted to create both the like political um, and like personal psychological, like set of problems that are defining the world right now, like this is this list really. So it's perfectionism, uh, a sense of urgency, which means result orientation, defensiveness, inability to tolerate any feedback or criticism, uh, valuing quantity over uh, quality, worship of the written word, um, which is interesting, like like intellectualism, Mm -hmm. um, uh, paternalism, uh, either or thinking, right? Thinking in binaries, not both and power hoarding, fear of open conflict, individualism, right? Progress meaning always bigger and more. So, you know, the, the way we've been trained in capitalism, uh, a belief in objectivity, which is a, a really interesting critique of, I think, modern media is that journalists actually believe they're objective. When yeah, yeah. They're clearly not. So if you looked at that basket of problems, I like when I look at the world can say like, this is this is an amazing basket of problems. They're, they're somehow related to each other. But I think it's been a lot of my work to say, oh, they're related through white supremacy, like that that's mm-hmm. the core mm-hmm rather than it being this sort of set of different issues that the world is facing. It's like they all converge in a place that feels really hard, even for progressive white people to grasp because we, I think we're trained even when we're trying to be anti-racist to view racism as one of the problems in the basket of problems that the world is facing. So um, it's, it's really interesting to say like, Oh yes, I would, that list of the 10 problems, you're like that, I, I would say that's a pretty exhaustive list of the problems the, the world is facing, but to actually say that's all definitive of white supremacy culture and that's what's at the center of it is kind of fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, how did you make that leap or do you remember what that process is like for you to just kind of um, start just, to- I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's just a lot of, you know, like, you know, re- reading books like, um, um, how to be an anti-racist, you know, or, um, you know, white fragility or raising white kids, which is a good, a good, um, book and, uh, just seeing sort of like, you know, the system, you know, at play. And this is interesting. This is what like people like you and others are doing as a modern Buddhist, like the Buddha doesn't really, he talks about interdependence a lot, but he doesn't talk about social systems. I mean, he talks about Sangha, talks about community, but he talks about social systems in a very like either this sense of bringing it back to the level of friendship or he talks on the level of like tribes or, you know, Mm -hmm. sanghas or communities. He's not he's not looking at like, oh, the way that I I mean, he must have had some insight that all humans on Earth were linked together somehow because he saw the truth of interdependence. But he doesn't talk about like economic systems or, you know, yeah. Which is int- kind of an interesting omission because there certainly were economic systems. And, mm-hmm. you know, as I understand it, like they were really shaping the way that 
people experience the world, you know, in, in, um, India at the time of the Buddha and not to mention, you know, the skin colors associated with those different, um, economic classes and castes. Um, so yeah, I wonder, I wonder about that. Although I know that the Buddha was, I mean, I know you're, you're such a historian. The Buddha was a, um, was from a Brahmanic caste, right? Like he was, uh, he was he was from the Kshatriya caste, so the okay. the other high caste. Yeah. Okay. I'm not um, sure that the Brahmins had kids or families. I'm not. I'm not 100. Sure. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. They were. I'm, I, I'm not, not exactly doing that. Sure, how that worked. They might have been. I I don't know. I, somebody's gonna like email me or you know and tell me <laughs> tell me what I'm missing, which is always which is how we learn, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I wonder. I wonder if it was. Um, I mean, I hope this is not heretical to say, but I wonder if that was one of the Buddha's areas of unconsciousness, you know, based on his own yeah. societal positioning. Um, I mean, I definitely think he had this, you know, um, love one another, let's all get along kind of um, uh, vibe, you know, <laughs> you look at yeah. like the Vinaya or the, you know, the um, Texan friendship or the Texan relationship. Um, but um, I think... You know, um, I see what you're saying about like he he didn't, although he was certainly a systems thinker, didn't articulate any of those systems in his teachings um, specifically. There there are some like you know, there's a text where the Buddha is asking a, a person of a lower caste um, for a drink of water. And he says, she says, no, I can't, you know, give it to you. You know, I tried to explain what her caste is. And he's like, no, I didn't ask you what your caste was. I just asked for a glass of water. You know, it was this kind of like radical thing to be able to take water from someone who was, you know, would have been seen in society be below him. So there was definitely, he wasn't like, you know, into the caste system, but um, I do think there's like a creative opportunity for those of us um you know, studying and practicing this tradition to apply the kind of core principles of what the Buddha taught to what we know to be true now, you know? Um, and that, that feels like fun and exciting, creative work. I'm really, I'm really happy to be a part of the group of people that are doing that now. Um, I get a lot from it and I feel like it, um, it gives me hope, you know, it gives me hope that there's a way to actually um, start to shift things uh, that doesn't require, doesn't require us to like um, set aside our ethics or our practices of caring for ourselves and the people close to us. Um, and it doesn't require us to um, say, oh, I can't do anything about this world out here. So I'm just going to ignore it and focus on me and, you know, myself and my family and being a good person and, and kind of end it there. But there's some, there's, that there's a framework that might actually be able to bridge these like multiple levels of experience, you know, from the personal and the interpersonal and the kind of community and the systemic levels that. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the book, I feel like you do like a lot, a lot of the book is kind of focusing on your own experience at the interpersonal level I think is a lot of the actual because this book is about friendship so it's really about interpersonal experience right it is yeah I think that in earlier drafts of the book there were I had more of an attempt to like um bring in examples from like all kind of different levels of friendship experience and then at some point I thought like okay I have to draw the dotted line around like what this book is actually about and so yeah. while I do think that there's like implications for you know societal uh, transformation, Part of the reason why is that um, what I noticed working in Buddhist communities that were interested in doing um, more justice work is that there was this strong, um, strong personal practice, right? Like people that have, you know, strong meditation and other mindfulness practices, contemplation, and then a strong kind of systemic analysis of what has mm -hmm. to happen, you know, in, in the world to change and mm -hmm. the way that we advocate or agitate, you know, for those kinds of, um, whether it's like policy shifts or cultural shifts, but then this area of friendship seemed to be like this murky place where, um, this, this murky place where the practice wasn't as articulated, but also that when the friendships weren't strong, um, there, 
the attempts to transform at the societal level seem to fall apart because the community, the group just couldn't stay together long enough to actually make those changes, you know? And so right. that was part of my my interest here too, is like, well, what what are the practices that could actually help us stay together long enough to affect the kind of change that we're talking about rather than, um, you know, coming together uh, as a group of people who want to change the world, having some big ideas, working on them until we completely like destroy each other emotionally and psychologically. And then like have to like leave and never, you know, spend like 10 years in a, in a Buddhist meditation center to be able to approach activism again. Yeah. And a lot of that seems like we don't, a lot of us who want to change the world for the better don't seem to know how to actually like talk to each other (laughs) yeah (laughs) i know right i mean or yeah don't know how or feel like we don't have time for that or don't see the don't see the connection or honestly like you know our like we're also sometimes drawn to the transformative work that we that we're trying to do because of our personal experiences, some of which were traumatizing, you know what I mean? Mm. So it's like, you want to like, you know, transform systems of violence in part because we're impacted by violence and then finding that, you know, without meaning to, we're replicating um, violent behaviors, you know, in our, in our relationships in subtle or not so subtle ways. And it's not, it's not an uncommon story. Yeah. So I feel like you also talk really, beautifully and you know with with a sense of humor and a sense of inclusiveness but about um you know being somebody interested in social justice somebody interested in dharma art or creative process and then um you know being biracial queer and be you know wanting to be an up-and-coming student and teacher and leader in dharma spaces and what it's like to enter mostly white spaces you know both in terms of faces and in terms of sort of um uh communities that are defined by the centering of whiteness you know mm-hmm. in in the, in the sort of just the the way hierarchies work, et cetera. So, um, do you, I mean, there's a lot of brilliant stuff in the book and, um, yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about what that's like, or is that, you know, what is it like to be, you know, trying to change something and, and be in a marginalized social position and have people just kind of like not get it or not, or care, but not really be able to like activate that caring into like meaningful change. Yeah. Whew. I mean, I feel like that's, <laughs> um, uh, what is it like? Um, it, it's hard. I mean, <laughs> I think, um, Yeah, there, there's, uh, there's like, oh my gosh, there's so many like aspects to it that I just kind of like flipping through my mind this moment. I mean, I think that one is, um, yeah, to be, um, like teaching and moving in, like, well, first of all, you know, a lot of these spaces are spaces that for all of their faults, um, you know, at a certain point in my life really saved my life. You know, when I mm. got into meditation, I was not doing good. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was like, it, and it wasn't like I was, um, you know, my life had crumbled or like I, you know, I wasn't um, probably, probably, you know, friends and family would look at my life and be like, oh, Kate's doing just fine, you know, but I felt um, like I was really struggling. I felt like there was a lot of um, suffering that I was dealing with. Personally, there's a lot of like suffering that I was aware of in society that I didn't know how to change. I felt really frustrated and embarrassed about that. Um, And like relationships that were just all wrong for me, you know? And so um, the, you know, white led, you know, perhaps like, white supremacy culturally shaped meditation spaces that I learned to practice in uh, really were refuges for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And they were places that like 
I was willing to go because I so desperately wanted these teachings and I didn't, for whatever reason, I felt more comfortable and welcomed in those spaces than I did in like an Asian um, uh, uh, Buddhist space of which there are many. And I realized that could have been a choice too, you know, like later, as many years later, I'm like, well, why didn't I just go to like a Chinese Buddhist center or like, you know, a Thai Buddhist center? I don't know. (laughs) You know, um, uh, I mean, I think partially with what what seemed to be available through media and, you know, the books that I was reading were mostly by these white teachers. And, um, and then there is this like initial, I talk about this in the book too, like what it's like to find a community that is, um, expressing the the values and doing the practices that like you've you've dreamed of finding people other people to do with and now like there's these this group of people that's already there that has been in this whole time and you're like oh my gosh where have you guys been like where have I, why didn't you find each other earlier and there's this like right. you know uh, um like falling in love period you know exactly like, yeah wow like um i can't believe you've been here this whole time like we've been walking this earth together and never knew it you know and and um and i felt like that with communities and then there's often this you know, rubbed his appointment when, you know, lo and behold, the um, systemic forces that, it, that some of which I'm, you know, <laughs> there at that space to heal from um, that exist outside, you know, the space in society also exist within it. And um, like, I'm, I've learned that there's a special, <laughs> there's a, like a, <laughs> a special way of like sidestepping or denying that ex- the presence of those those forces and mm-hmm. those experiences that feels especially harmful because it's like spiritual, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where like I think I mean, we used to joke about yeah. like people in meditation communities who would write these like scathing emails and then sign it like Meta, you know? <laughs> like, oh my god! <laughs> you know, and I think what was really hard for me was like you know the 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 consistently. Um, when I like was struggling with things that would happen in my life um, that I was trying to understand through the lens of the Dharma um, and talk to teachers about, or um, something that would happen in the Dharma center that was like harmful. Like someone would, you know, think that I didn't belong there or someone tell me to leave or, you know, um, make assumptions about um, my life uh, or, you know, what I liked or disliked or, you know, my experience in the Dharma, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, try to talk to someone about the center about it. And they're, they're, there, yeah, it was often this, um, you know, nobody wants, wants it to be true that there's like racism and other forms of injustice and oppression, like in these spaces that we love, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, I was complaining to a a friend and teacher once about like the, just the disconnect between the um, like stated wish for all beings to be happy and free and fully liberated. And the way that, um, uh, you know, this particular meditation space that I was in was going through a period of time that felt particularly like not happy and not free. (laughs) Um, And, uh, you know, particularly caught. And, And this teacher was like, well, she's like, you know, we have to remember that even when we're, trying to teach the Dharma that um, we're teaching it like in samsara, you know, this is, this is, this is what it is. There's a lot of suffering in this realm. So, um, so that's kind of what it's like. It's like um, knowing that, you know, folks are good people and meanwhile, and also being very, very frustrated at the kind of, um, the armor that people have built around um, being in touch with the reality of our common experience, like certain dimensions of that reality, because some things you actually have to actively try not to see. I think, you know, like at this point you would be, you know, really like have to have some willfulness around, you know, ignorance of certain kind of dynamics um, in, in, in our communities and our society. Um, Yes, you would. And that said, you know, I know also that, um, I can't assume that I'm never part of the problem too, you know? Mm. And I think like when it, when, when you're reading that list of characteristics, white supremacy culture and, you know, um, worship of the written word or, you know, like, um, uh, the academic culture that sometimes exists within Dharma spaces, you know, like I have a master's degree. I just wrote a book like, and, um, 
And it's a really good book too. So you should oh. get it. Radical <laughs> friendship. Everybody, everybody go order it from your independent bookseller right now. But you know, I think like that's another a, a thing that I I wanna um like as I as I grow and as I get, you know, I, I think more humble um about uh the way that I participate in these systems and in these communities, like wanna always also be asking the question like. And how am I participating as well? Mm -hmm. um, and, and and to look at the ways in which I do have um, power and, and privilege, uh, maybe not um, in terms of race, but there's there are certainly other areas um, where I'm less, um, less aware of the impact that I'm having on other people. And if I don't, um, if I don't really listen and if I'm not willing to um to try to see things differently than I currently see them, that I can also be, I, I can be that person that someone's so frustrated with because he just doesn't see and won't, won't consider. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking of, cause you know, what, what often comes up for me is, is a feeling of, I don't know, some feeling like insufficiency or failure at being able to um, transform things, you know, and to, to create more inclusive um, and more equitable, you know, spaces and, um, and, you know, like the, the feeling of often like, you know, having been in situations where I was, you know, in, in leadership, you know, at, um, early ages, you know, um, starting, uh, founding an organization, the interdependence project, working in the, the Shambhala organization. And, you know, you could argue that the interdependence project, I had more, ability to leverage, you know, structures. Um, I mean, that's, that's part of the tragedy of, of Shambhala for me is like, same thing, like, what did I participate in? And mm -hmm. a lot of the teachings were great and the hierarchy, hierarchical models, you know, sucked to, to put it simply. And, um, but that feeling of like being associated with something very strongly, but also feeling like you have very little actual kind of ability to change something. And I think that's, Sometimes when people aren't in leadership position, just that that one of the reasons I want to see a much more um, equitable um, sharing of leadership roles is then then you find out like how hard it actually is and how much of the time you actually do feel like a failure and you feel like, oh, there's not actually that much I can do here. And mm. and it's um, that's in, that's an insufficient answer, you know, and I think like with the interdependence project, there was the, the, the initial uh kind of intention was to get more young people into the dharma and to also have the dharma touch these different areas of you know culture and activism and and arts you know in and uh, western psychology and conversation and so figuring out how to do that how to like you know pay for stuff you know it just <laughs> it, it it feels like a, a lot right and that's why i think this this notion of this core vision of the like the realm of samsara that we are in the, this human realm being conditioned by white supremacy you know feels like really important because it kind of brings you back to like what the root klesha or root you know obstruction is sort yeah. of and it does seem like though a lot of us well-intentioned white folks like there's there's still this like holding on to not wanting to be racist and I find it really helpful to just be like, you don't even have to say you're racist. You just have to say you're part of a racist system. And that means you have a lot of internalized that racism lives within you, yeah. you know, rather than it being like some intentionality and that, that to be able to frame it mm. that way to me feels like a huge relief because mm. then it removes the blame. It's just like, okay, what are we going to do? What am I going to do about this? But I do find that a lot of people get especially defensive around that. Like, it's not calling you racist. It's saying you're a privileged and, you know, dominant and yeah. cast in a, in a racist system. It's it's not about you. <laughs> right. Right. It, I mean, that's interesting to like the I am versus I have, you know, within this, you know, this constellation of self, like the, these elements. Yeah. Um, it makes it much less personal. I think to say it that way. And yeah, you know, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that you said. I mean, one, I do think it's really interesting that when I look at these hierarchical structures of leadership, um, 
almost everyone, even people at the very upper echelons of leadership say, I don't feel like I have the power to change things. And I'm, I know that feeling, that's a real feeling. I'm not sure how true that is. You know, I know that it's like universal, like people universally express that. Right. Um, but uh, I mean, I think that's part of the kind of delusion of like these hierarchical, you know, systems and right. these, you know, supremacist systems is that the people who have power, like, don't feel like they have it, feel like someone else has it. And therefore, like, actually don't, 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 don't wield it in service of their values in a way that they'd really like to. And, and it, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm still not sure why that feels very mysterious to me. Yeah, um, no, I, I agree with you a hundred percent that I'm just, I'm just sharing what the feeling is. Yeah, to yeah, totally. In a leadership and, and it, position. Yeah. Absolutely. I get it too, you know? Um, and then yeah, I wonder I wonder what would um what would be the practice of helping us to actually feel the power that we have when we have it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do my feeling is that, you know, that all these conversations of power and hierarchy and white supremacy and patriarchy. I mean, I'm saying this from a very privileged standpoint, but that it's still in its very nascent, almost kind of adolescent phase. Mm. And at a certain point, like I, I feel like the model for like a, a perfect example of like actually wielding one's power is the, the example of Ida Bay Wells, you know, what happened with the 1619 project and her, you know, conservative elements refusing to give her, uh, tenure at UNC and, you know, and basically like Hannah, Hannah Nicole Jones. Um, yes. I'm sorry. Where, why did I say Ida Bay Wells? Sorry. Um, I mean, she's also awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm getting my people confused. All right. We're going to, we're going to edit that part <laughs> and the earlier part. <laughs> but yeah, but about Hannah Nicole Jones. Sorry, I'm my brain is not working so well. Oh, okay. um, yeah, <laughs> no, sleep. about about I knew it was three names. That's exactly why. Uh, yeah, about <laughs> Hannah Nicole Jones and uh, you know the the UNC and the um, the uh, um, her basically the progressive uh, pressure forcing them to give her kind of um, uh, what would you say like. Uh, resentful tenure offer and she mm -hmm. had already made made a deal a better deal with howard university right so yeah. so she's kind of choosing to leverage her power and saying here's what i'm participating in, you know <laughs> now she had those options right so not everybody feels like they have a, there's a better offer right. right on the table but and there the power was to say no i'm gonna i'm gonna go to this other institution or Right. You do, you do with the UNC, you don't even have to say like UNC sucks or it's flawed. You know, it's, it's not even a call out. You're just saying, no, I'm, I'm going to go participate. Like I saw somebody write on Twitter about it. The, the lesson there is to go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> if we all had that, you know, that, that's the thing is we don't always feel like we have that, that option. Right. And, right. um, yeah, I mean, it's just an interesting conversation about like how how does empowerment actually work, and I think that's kind of the rather than who's doing something wrong, you know, like what is a more positive mode of empowerment? That that to me feels like the the more grown up phase of the mm -hmm. conversation, and we're more in this like pointing out the systems and the individuals who have done really bad things within those systems. Phase. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. Is a part of it. I mean, I think, yeah, the way she dealt with that was like a hundred percent, you know, like, like the word that comes to mind is like classy. Like that was like a yeah, classy Yeah, it was move. like a cosmic badass move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, I feel like the, um, it really struck this like beautiful middle space of, um, a lot without like she didn't need to like malign the character of any individuals like she didn't need to you know she just let what was happening be visible you know mm -hmm. and i think that that what happens so often for you know those of us who 
like have the option, as you say, to like move to a place where we're like celebrated instead of just tolerated, um, is that in an effort not to be seen as like, you know, fill in the blank, like, you know, the angry black woman, the like, you know, um, uh, petty person with a chip on their shoulder. We don't say like, Hey, this is what happened to me here, you know? And so those like, um, those, yeah, those institutions and those systems continue to operate in the way they've always been operating. Cause like no one's challenging it and no one really, it's like, we see it, but we don't, aren't making meaning of what we're seeing, you know? Right. And so there's this way of like pointing to, or like high highlighting or, you know, yeah, I think it is it's a making visible of a system that's already there, but it's so, it's so deeply embedded. It's like, um, it's like sunken into the woodwork kind of, it's almost right. like, you know, if we could like, you know, do, doing like a refinish so that we could like right. actually see the details again and be like, Oh, this is what it's made of. And this is the pattern. And Oh, do we, do we actually really want that? Or have we somehow continue to participate in a system that like no one who's very few people who are here today actually benefit from or really want <laughs> anymore, you right. know? Um, right. And, uh, and that's, that's something else that I think that that she and her team and and also like everybody else did. I mean, the number of people who signal boosted that um, that uh, issue of you know her not being offered tenure was just incredible, you know. Um, and so I, yeah, yeah, it was also nice to see how people got behind got behind her. Yeah, uh, in that moment, yeah. So that's the other aspect that we're talking about is a, a sense of transparency, right? In these spaces, that that would correct a lot, but that that defensiveness, conflict aversion in the white supremacy culture. So you talk a lot, I think, and you we haven't had a very humorous conversation, but there's a lot of moments of humor in this book, and especially the lines of the Mita Sutra where it says a good, a good spiritual friend uh, tells you their secrets and, and keeps yours. Mm-hmm. So how important is that to be kind of like open with our secrets? Like how how do those boundaries work for you interpreting the sutta and Mm. because it really doesn't feel like we live in a world where we are open with our secrets yeah I think you know I mean that's a place where I feel like that um even though I know that like it could you know folks could bristle against it but like I think your characterization of what's like where we're still in our adolescence and like still have some like maturity to gain kind of in our like relational capacity culturally uh, I feel like the place around um like telling of secrets and keeping of secrets um, is in terms of like how we, how we communicate, what we share, when, you know, to whom, for what purpose um, and how we receive those truths from each other feels like a real key place around like how we can, you know, show up for each other as it, and both as individual within, within individual interpersonal relationships and also kind of um, as, as communities. And um, I, I think we're still growing in that. And part of it is that the, um, the ways that we can communicate have so exploded, you know, in terms of like how we use, um, you know, social media and the fact that everyone can make media now and, um, and the the great power of that. Right. And also the, um, awkwardness of like, you know, (laughs) how much we share and, 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 and what, um, and what, what being transparent really means, you know? Um, I mean, in that, uh, in the chapter on telling secrets, I I think I talk about secrets as um, not just exposing kind of like salacious details of our inner life, but also telling the truth about um, experiences that need to change. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that part of what the culture of silence around white supremacy culture has created is a space where when we do feel harmed, um, it, it feels sometimes interpersonal and we, we, um, we, let me put it this way. We experience so much of the harm we experience in systemic symptoms of oppression is experienced interpersonally. You know, it's experienced Mm -hmm. in these like, um, relational slights, these like turning aways, these like, you know, hurtful comments and assumptions, um, uh, and, um, vibes, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like, um, and uh, and oftentimes, in I think um, in I'm sorry, my, my can you hear my baby? 
Yeah, we, we're going to talk about the friendship of, of parenthood and motherhood. <laughs> might be our last topic. <laughs> but, um, she's, uh, that's, that's that's Maple. She's almost uh, seven months old. Yeah, she's going to be seven months on Wednesday. All right. Uh, I, I, lo- I love that you're still in the phase where you're still counting m- months as, <laughs> as like mon- month days. Totally. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the but, candle should go to the mother, though, at that point. Like she should get birthday yeah, candles should. on on her actual birthdays, but you should get birthday candles on each month that she's <laughs> still here. for real every, every month every month you know in the pregnancy is different every month postpartum is really different too um but um oh gosh and because i only get four hours of sleep at a time or less what, what were we talking about <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about telling secrets oh and, yeah yeah and and how much to share and yeah i think um oh because because we have this like this um, you know, white supremacist cultural um, imperative around um, like not showing vulnerability, not um, expressing when we are, have been harmed or hurt because so much of the way that we experience that harm is, does appear to be interpersonal in nature. Um, the idea is that if we are um, hurt in a relationship, um it's our own fault. Like there's something wrong with us um, that Mm. we didn't protect ourselves from that or that, um, you know, there can just be this like sense of shame around like, um, yeah, having, having, it doesn't make sense, you know, but I think um, it, it, it seems to be true. Like, um, and And things also grow bigger when you can't address them directly in the moment too, right? That that there's a sense of like the 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 harm, it sort of like festers in yeah, a way. Yeah, yeah. I be think that's called or healed. Resentment. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is called resentment. <laughs> <laughs> Where, you know, the sense of like heaviness, yeah, that com- that then then comes into our relationships, sometimes not only with the person who um who we had that harm with, but, um, or we experienced har- harm in that relationship, but like in, in, in all of our relationships, then I think that's how, how white supremacy starts to impact all of our relationships, whether we benefit from white privilege or not, um, is that the, the baggage of that starts to, we, we start to, we can't talk about it. <laughs> we don't have language for it. Um, we're still, I think, as you mentioned, like in the developmental stages of how we talk about how we've been impacted by living in these systems. Um, and so, uh, as a result of that, we carry this like heavy load with us as we approach each, each, you know, existing or new relationship. And that can be heavy. I think also like part of the uh, thing about, um, telling secrets is allowing ourselves to be like seen and known, um, which is, which is another point of vulnerability, like for real, for real, because, um, there are, I think, competing desires um, often or competing intentions, like one to be like seen and known, the other to like to hide and to be like, mm. you know, not not seen. Um, and I'm an extrovert introvert, so I know that one well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a introvert who loves people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is this... Um, this way in which I think because of um, because of the made of media works because of the way like our our personhood and relationships have been impacted by branding culture. There's I feel like this need to make um, a self that feels cohesive culturally, and that's very similar to what you know the, the Buddha talked about is like not the self is like not this kind of um, uh, like smooth um, contained. Uh, all make sense together, kind of one thing, um, which is which is what what a brand, what a brand does, and and what what branding has done to people, right? And so there's something I think about, um, like telling secrets that is about um, just coming out about who we really are and what we really like and what we really don't like and the idiosyncrasies that make up who we are, and not not in a way that's like this staged like. You know, as I say this, I'm thinking about like, you know, some like Instagram girl who's like, this is me when I first wake up and like, I'm being right. real today, you know, like, <laughs> like but like, 
it's unreal that that's that that's it's weird because so many people follow that but then when you talk to the people who follow that they're like oh my god can you believe she did that can you believe and i'm like well why not unfollow that person then you know it's it's it, the whole realm kind of it's like we we all participate but then we like feel like we're like what what am i doing you know yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. why did i click on that <laughs> right right why am i staying here I mean, I think that's a good question. Like, why do I stay in relationships that like feel like they um, an- annoy me, <laughs> you know, like frustrate me, or where I don't really feel like seen or loved, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, let's talk about you. You do mention a lot in the book um, the the Dharma of stepmotherhood. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is a tough gig from, I, I, I had a stepmother once. I think she had a very tough gig. Um, and you don't know whether or not she had a tough gig. (laughs) (laughs) I think, I think, I think that one was complicated on all sides, Okay, but, uh, but, uh, may she be very happy and uh, wishing her the best for, for real. Um, and and then you came into the gig of um, giving birth, and um, but that was I think af- probably after knowing, knowing the timeline of the book. I think that was uh, after the the uh, timeline of probably the the final rough draft. Yeah, know, that, that Maple came came in her Aquarius way, as we were talking about before <laughs> the podcast. In, into in the her world. own time, in her own time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, how so is that about friendship? I, I wanted to share, like, um, comedian John Mulaney once said that he's always confused when people say, my mom is my best friend. He goes, oh, really? Was she a really bad mom then? <laughs> <laughs> but in what way is, is motherhood about uh, friendship or radical friendship? Does that yeah. apply or is that a different set of teachings? No, and we I can't mean, only I... look to the Buddha there, right? Because he was a deadbeat dad. Yeah. <laughs> Well, people people want to make an argument that the Buddha like came back and that you know his his wife was like you know oh I'm you know that she she ordained and then his son ordained and you know I don't know there's a lot of a lot of um, deadbeat Buddha dad apologists out there um, who try to convince Agreed. me that he wasn't like that he wasn't just like a, a, um, a Rolling Stone but um, my understanding of these teachings you know which i'm calling radical friendship um is not that they can only be expressed within the the relationships that we talk about as friends but that they can be expressed in all of our relationships and and that there's you know maybe i don't want to be my kid's best friend and all you know i'm not want to be like you know getting a ton of candy and like you know eating it till we get sick and watching like my little pony till we pass out or something you know like <laughs> Um, but, um, how can I be a friend to her in terms of like helping support her freedom journey, which will be different than mine? Um, Mm -hmm. and what can I learn from her in how she's showing up as a, as a person in this, in this world who, you know, her paths have so like delightfully collided, like how, what can I learn that can also inform me about um, both where I am still caught uh, and where I could be more free and how. Mm. Uh, and I think that I've learned a lot about that in parenting. Um, and it's been very humbling because, um, you know, we, we talked, I think this book just out of necessity, you know, focuses primarily on, um, you know, racism and racial injustice and white supremacy, but ageism is a huge um really unacknowledged, uh, force in our, our world. Um, my sister, who's a young adult librarian talked about it once, like so passionately, I heard her say, you know, like there's no, there's no group of people in this world. So disenfranchised, so unheard, you know, with, with so little ability to advocate for themselves or, you know, so little consideration taken as children. Um, and I'd like to think that, you know, I'm not, (laughs) I'm not like that. And yet, you know, um, it has been such a lesson for me to learn how to, um, you know, slow down, uh, for my kids, how to, um, listen to their intelligence and their wisdom, you know, which doesn't take the same form as mine. And is kind of like this, you know, otherworldly, you know, 
experiential, natural wisdom still um, from that they came with. Uh, they're like really acquiring in the moment. Um, yeah. And um, really like, I guess as I'm talking about now, I'm really thinking like, you know, that part of, part of the stance of radical friendship is it's about, you know, showing up for liberation, but it's also like this inherent belief that every single human being has something to offer and something to teach, you know, um, and to be able to welcome those lessons with warmth and grace and care, um, is part of my aspiration as a parent, you know, um, it's a hard with no sleep sometimes, but <laughs> that's, that's my it goal. Is. That part gets easier and then it gets harder again. And then it gets easier. Um, and then, and then, and then I think every parent I've talked to at a certain point, you just where, say, where did all the time go? Oh. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good place to leave it, but maybe we can talk more about, about the, the radical friendship of parenthood sometime. Oh my gosh. I would love to. And I feel like that's really needed. I I've been having my, um, because my kid, uh, in her true Aquarius fashion, decided that she doesn't do bottles. Uh, <laughs> So, but I've been teaching retreats online. The kids got to eat, you know, like I, I got to feed her. And um, it's been such an interesting thing to let my parenting be a visible part of my, my Dharma teaching um, mm. and much more disruptive than I ever anticipated. Like for me, I was just, it was kind of practical, um, but it's been, it's been, um, that's been an interesting journey too. I'd love to talk about that sometime. Right. Well, that's, that sounds like a great way to break the mold of like what a Dharma teacher or teaching is supposed to look like, you know, mm-hmm. so that, that sounds great. Well, it's um, like breastfeeding. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Just people tune in for two hours to watch you. <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think it's a good place to leave off. Uh, Kate Johnson, um, you can check out her website, which is Kate with a K, K A T E Johnson.com and Radical Friendship, Seven Ways to Love Yourself and Find Your People in an Unjust World, uh, is recently out. And uh, I highly recommend it. And uh, Kate, it's it's so great to be in conversation with you and also share that conversation with other people via this new thing people are doing called a podcast. <laughs> it's good to be here with you too, Ethan. Always. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So for uh, Ethan Nickturn, I mean, sorry, for the Road Home Podcast, we're not editing that one. Um, For the Road Home Podcast, this is Ethan Nickturn. That's right. I said that correctly. Um, And uh, we'll see you all next time. 